COPD is a very common disease. You're going to meet these people throughout your career, and they live their life on a balance, walking the tightrope of respiratory muscle power and the increased load that their disease inflicts on them. The acute exacerbation of COPD can be life-threatening. People living with COPD have lungs that are chronically hyperinflated. They have chronic airway obstruction that limits exhalation, and their lung architecture is severely damaged, looking like garbage bags rather than lungs. Their airways are sticky with all kinds of mucus and crap from chronic inflammation, and because of this hyperinflation, their respiratory muscles are overstretched and chronically weak from years of excessive load. Living a life in this balance can come tumbling down the minute a virus or bacteria comes to town. It really doesn't take much to begin that downward spiral towards death. Airway obstruction is a chronic problem in COPD and a key element in that spiral. It leads first to a condition called dynamic hyperinflation. Dynamic hyperinflation occurs when a patient cannot completely exhale before the next breath. Try it yourself. As you exhale, suddenly start another breath. Do this repeatedly and you will find yourself almost completely blown up like a balloon. You can tell that dynamic hyperinflation is occurring by measuring the pressure in the airway at the end of exhalation. Normally, at end exhalation, there is no airflow and the pressure in the airway will be atmospheric or zero. When there is residual airflow, there is a pressure difference between the atmosphere and the lungs and this pressure is positive end expiratory pressure. Because this positive end expiratory pressure is coming from a lung condition, we refer to it as auto or intrinsic PEEP. So, hyperinflation ultimately leads to intrinsic PEEP. Hyperinflation caused by airway obstruction leads to increased work. The respiratory muscles need to do more work to overcome intrinsic PEEP and create a negative pressure for inflation. Now consider somebody breathing spontaneously. We need to generate about minus three centimeters of pressure inside our lungs in order to get a breath out. But when somebody has an intrinsic peak of say five centimeters, then he must generate a total pressure of eight just to get a breath in. Now there's a double whammy as well because hyperinflation leads to less respiratory muscle power because of the mechanical disadvantage. When muscles are overstretched, the muscle fibers are not operating at their most efficient length tension relationship. The loss of inspiratory muscle power causes an overall reduction in alveolar ventilation. This decrease in alveolar ventilation inevitably leads to an increase in the PCO2. The rising CO2 causes the patient to become more tachypneic, leading to an extreme panic. The panic and tachypnea causes more hyperinflation because the patient is not completely exhaling before they take their next breath. This results in more intrinsic peak. The smaller tidal volumes also causes more dead space. The rising CO2 causes the patient to become more tachypneic, causing extreme panic. The panic and tachypnea causes hyperinflation because the patient is not completely exhaling before they take their next breath. This results in more intrinsic peak. The smaller tidal volumes also cause more dead space ventilation. Dead space ventilation is wasted ventilation. There are two types of dead space. Anatomic dead space, the tidal volume that remains within the trachea and large bronchi and not available for gas exchange. And secondly, physiologic dead space, the areas of the lung that have more ventilation to perfusion also known as VQ mismatch or wasted ventilation. Tachypnea can cause an increase in the dead space fraction because it causes a decrease in the tidal volume. Consider an anatomical dead space of 150 milliliters. A tidal volume of 500 milliliters gives you a dead space fraction of 30%. With tachypnea, the tidal volume can fall to as low as 200 milliliters. 
Now, 75% of the tidal volume is in the dead space. This increase in dead space causes an increase in the PaCO2. Tachypnea leads to worsening respiratory muscle fatigue. The fatigue causes more hyperinflation and so on onto a vicious cycle that ultimately leads to respiratory arrest and death. The treatment for acute on chronic respiratory failure is relatively straightforward. Well, first and foremost, we shouldn't be afraid to give oxygen to these patients. There is this myth going around that giving too much oxygen will lead to a loss in the respiratory drive. I can tell you that's complete and utter nonsense. There are two circumstances when the carbon dioxide levels will rise when you give somebody oxygen. First case, there is inevitably going to be a change in the DQ match in the lungs because of the oxygen-induced vasodilation. You should expect to see a small rise in the CO2 in those circumstances, but the patient will otherwise be pretty stable. The second time is when you coincidentally are giving oxygen to a patient who is in fact developing respiratory arrest and the CO2 is going up for that reason, not because of the oxygen. Therefore, you should never be afraid to give a patient with acute on chronic respiratory failure oxygen and maintain their oxygen saturations of 92%. Furthermore, you should never expect to see severe hypoxemia in this patient population. And any amount of hypoxia should be easily correctable. If it isn't, then there's probably a shunt compounding this problem, and the cause for that needs to be found. One of the mainstays of treatment in acute on chronic respiratory failure is non-invasive ventilation. Now, this is a first-line therapy in class one indication. It is well established to save lives, reduce the need for intubation, and decrease the length of stay in the hospital. There are several contraindications for non-invasive ventilation, but the most important is whether or not the patient is awake enough to participate. Once the level of consciousness goes down, intubation is probably inevitable in these cases. Non-invasive ventilation has a variety of beneficial effects. The most important one is the ability to reduce the work of breathing and take the load off the failing respiratory muscle. It counteracts the intrinsic PEEP. Recall that these patients have a significant amount of intrinsic PEEP and have trouble generating the pressures necessary to get air in. If you have a patient with an intrinsic PEEP of 8 and they need to generate an airway pressure of minus 3 to inhale, then they'll need to generate a total of 11. But if you place that patient on non-invasive ventilation and match the intrinsic PEEP, then the patient only needs to generate minus 3 to get a breath in. And as a bonus, the non-invasive ventilator has the ability to sense the patient's respiratory efforts and trigger to take the load off of the lungs. It's critical to remember that non-invasive ventilation is used to buy time while the other therapies are being initiated. The danger with non-invasive ventilation is being lulled into a false sense of security, believing that the patient is stable when in fact they're slowly developing terminal respiratory failure. It's important to remain vigilant and look for signs of failure even when the patient is on non-invasive Medical therapy for acute and chronic respiratory failure is straightforward enough that it should almost be routine. All patients will need to be on a bronchodilator, including a beta agonist and an anticholinergic inhaler. Because airway inflammation is a significant factor, patients should always be placed on either oral or intravenous steroids to reduce the inflammation in the airway and reduce hyperinflation. And then finally, infections are frequently responsible for the exacerbation prompt administration of antibiotics and antivirals is necessary. Today we talked about the common problem of acute on chronic respiratory failure. This is frequently seen because COPD is a common medical condition. We talked about the fragile balance that these patients live on and how easy it is to get into a death spiral. There is worsening airway obstruction leading to dynamic hyperinflation causing a loss of muscle power from mechanical disadvantage, leading to a reduction in alveolar ventilation, and an increase in the PCO2 that causes panic and tachypnea and worsens dead space ventilation, collapsing all onto respiratory muscles that are fatiguing, and as they're exhausted, spinning the cycle downward onto death. Non-invasive mechanical ventilation is a key therapy, saves lives, and decreases complications. We also reviewed the pharmacological therapies for acute and chronic respiratory failure, including bronchodilators, steroids, and antibiotics. Until next time.